In today's episode, we're going to be talking about how complementary medicines and health supplements are being defined in South Africa. And specifically, what is the legal debate that's currently underway in terms of who gets to regulate this space? It's quite an important topic because there's a very fine line between defining something as a medicine and defining potentially a health supplement as a medicine. And now to discuss this, I've got Prom Shin Lesai, Dunmarie Duguid, to help us unpack this in more detail, look at the legal definitions. And despite it being legal, I really want you to see the larger implications that can come from this type of decision making. I hope you enjoy the episode. Hi, Dan Marie. It's great to have you on. Uh, today, we want to actually tackle a debate that's been going around in the courts, specifically between the Alliance of Natural Health Products of South Africa, as well as the Minister of Health and SAPRA. And this relates back to the definitions around Category D medicines or complementary medicines and health supplements. Um, can you maybe unpack for us as a lawyer a bit of the context behind, you know, what happened in August of uh, 2017 that kind of set out this debate that started between these, these different entities? Sure, Jeff. Well, thanks for having me. So just to set the scene, in August 2017, the minister released new regulations related to the registration of certain medicines. Now, the regulations also introduced a new category of medicines, namely complementary medicines under what's known as Category D. And then this is further subcategorized into discipline-specific medicines and health supplements. Now, the regulations attach a number of obligations to complementary medicines and where applicable to health supplements. So these include obligations, for example, in terms of labeling your containers, furnishing provisional or professional information, patient leaflets, advertising, that sort of thing. Um, and, and that's what gave rise is this, this new definition of complementary medicine and those who then fall within that and therefore need to comply with SARPRAS regulations in regard. Yeah, 100%. I mean, it was pretty broad. I mean, to give you an example, they really targeted like plant derived uh, products. Uh, and I mean, the definition, I rec remember it being about maintaining or ass assisting uh, the physical and mental, mental state of a person, which is like, I mean, how's that different to some extent with food? Uh, and it included specific things related to like amino acids, the building blocks of proteins, saccharides, you know, polysaccharides being sugars, vitamins. And I think this was the question maybe, and in terms of like this went back, there was a court ruling, obviously take us back to maybe October of uh, 2020, because that was when there was a ruling. And then we'll get to the appeal that recently happened in April. And then we can talk about, you know, what happened in October that kind of uh, maybe upset uh, SAPRA and the Department of Health. And then where did the appeal land in terms of recently in April? Sure. So, um, as you've mentioned, the Alliance of Natural Health Products South Africa, as I refer to them as the Alliance, took this regulations on review. And the review ground relied upon by the Alliance was that the scope and ambit of the regulations exceeded the rulemaking powers of the Minister of Health in terms of the Medicines Act. So, in essence, the contention was that the Minister was only empowered to regulate medicines and scheduled substances within the meaning of the Act. However, so it was contended, the regulations purported to regulate substances that were neither medicines or scheduled substances. And to that extent, it was argued that the minister was acting what we refer to as ultra B res outside of his powers. And this is what is now I'll loosely referred to as the ultra B res ground. Now, two additional grounds were put forward by the Alliance namely a procedural ground that on the basis that there was not sufficient consideration by the minister of comments provided in relation to these draft regulations, and that these regulations were secondly or thirdly, substantively irrational for lack of capacity by SARPRA to process these mandated registration applications. Now in turn, the minister confirmed on oath that he had considered these comments received in response and that SAPRA has in fact been provided with additional resources to process the applications. Now the minister and SAPRA further then argued that the application raised what they refer to as an impermissible abstract challenge. Now they deny that the regulations were ultra be raised in any respect on the basis that the definition of medicine in the act was sufficiently wide to include complementary medicines and health supplements as they've defined it in the regulations. Now, these definitions, as you've pointed out, is what then lies at the heart of this dispute at the end of the day. 
So the High Court rejected the argument by the minister and found for the alliance on the ultra v race ground, meaning that they found that he was outside of his powers. Mm -hmm. As a result, it was held that although the Act permits the regulation of complementary medicines, any regulation that purports to bring substances that cannot rightly be classified as medicine into the ambit of the Act should rather not be permitted. Yeah, perfect. So this was this was the grounds of the that was the the essence of the matter that ran in the High Court in October 2020. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, this is essentially the biggest issue. I mean, it's very broad. Uh, if you go back to the original uh, Gazette documents, I mean, I have to say that this this idea that um, so much that falls within food uh, and a food definition can easily be classified as a medicine. And I, I think this is where there's almost a need for almost a practical approach, because I, I often think of the director of food control as well in this in this regard. I mean, there is this department within the, the ministry of the Department of Health that's responsible for the quality of food. And when we're talking about health supplements, uh, I mean, where do we stretch the line in the definition of, of what is a, a food product or a food stuff and what is really a medicine? And I'll use a practical example of this as well. I mean, I've often seen things like CBD chocolates. Now, CBD is a bit uh, more specific than I think these regulations even stretch far beyond something that would be defined in the UK as a novel food because it wasn't introduced to sustainable diets in any measurable format prior to a certain date. So I understand where novel food regulation stands in you know, the UK, Europe, and other regions. But, and, and I mean, this is not even at the heart of the matter, but it's correlated because, I mean, I look at CBD chocolates and I look at it and it's a Schedule Zero medicine and it's advertised next to a Kit Kat. Uh, in the almost the owl just as you queue to go shopping uh, and I mean a child can easily just grab this chocolate and say mommy mommy I want this chocolate and it's like <laughs> it's I mean you are allowed to sell complementary medicines at any kind of spa pick and pay etc but to have it next to Kit Kats and then to try and make an inference that this is medicine I mean there's two aspects to it the one is the challenges of complementary medicines there should be a approach to good manufacturing practices and now, how do you introduce this without the presence of a pharmacist at a site? And now, if something like a chocolate is being categorized as medicine, like how realistic is it for the regulator to actually audit these facilities, audit the products, ensure that the backlog gets cleared for, like you said, patient information leaflets, labeling claims. I mean, it's great to have the concept of regulation, but to enforce regulation is a completely different issue. And I think we've had so much issue already with more mainstream medicines that have counterfeiting and other issues related to auditing that to now take on essentially foodstuffs uh, or dietary supplements or, I mean, food supplements seems very ambitious and perhaps un unnecessary to some extent to like, why does Safra want to load themselves? And then why does the minister really want to load this onto the necks of already a strained, I would say, medical environment, especially in light of everything that's happened with COVID. I mean, what are your comments maybe on this is like, should a department like, like the director of food control actually become more active and say, look, we put up our hand here. We have a department that's supposed to regulate foodstuffs, cosmetics and disinfectants. And we have an act to support that. Uh, it is Department of Health and they are still within that department, maybe overstretching with a medicine definition. Yeah, you see, that's an interesting one. So um, just quickly referring back to the ACA. So in they kind of dissect these definitions very, very clearly. And the definition of medicine in itself was found by the ACA to be sufficient, um, as in what is a medicine and how is it defined? Um, and I can, I mean, I can read it to you if you want to, but it, it really is just comes down to the fact that it makes claims with regards to your health, right? Yeah. And um the moment that it, it, it's not defined as medicine, it shouldn't be falling under the Medicines Act. And in that relation, it cannot be governed by SARPRA. It's completely out of SARPRA's hands if it's not within the Medicines Act. Yeah. Now, the SCA also commented that it appears from the evidence there is a substantial market worldwide and in South Africa for the complementary medicines and health supplement market. And what was not really in dispute is this market should be regulated in the public interest. And I think both parties agreed to this. Mm. What is, however, very key here is that the regulations must be drafted in a manner that's lawful and properly empowered, meaning that the entity that is meant to look after the section of the society's public interest, that is the, the, the participant that should take taking care of that. Now, as you've mentioned, like a CBD chocolate, it is a Schedule Zero substance, 100% in terms of the definition of, that we find in the Medicines Act and scheduling at the time of this video. So 
it is a Schedule Zero substance. And the other side of the argument is it can't be a foodstuff because as you've pointed out, it is not ordinarily ingested by, pe by people where a hemp powder in contrast, you can argue was ordinarily ingested, right? So it, it we are also caught in this kind of a, like a, a gray area as we've all been struggling with in South Africa in certain areas of the law where it's, you know, um, in specific to cannabis products, which is my speciality, the cannabis products especially, it's just this um, not sufficient regulation, not sufficient legislation to make provision at this point in time. We've got the Drugs Act, which also plays a part in certain of these things, like you said, CBD chocolate in that instance then. So in the Drugs Act, if it's not a Schedule Zero medicine and it's being sold on, it could actually be falling foul of the Drugs Act because cannabis is defined as the plant or any portion of the plant or product thereof. So, um, you know, it, it, it does make things a little bit difficult in that regard um, to define these things clearly and to find an empowered house to also take care of it. Because, I mean, you and I don't want products on the market, you know, that um, is, isn't safely manufactured. But it also begs the question, you know, um, is, is the manufacturing practices under the Foodstuffs Act sufficient to extend to, for example, health supplements? Mm. And is that not the appropriate legislation to rather empower health supplements versus the Medicines Act, which as the court has now held, is not sufficient if it doesn't actually fall as a medicine. It shouldn't be regulated by the Minister of Health or SAPRA if it's not a medicine. Yeah, fully. I mean, what I'll do is I'll also list in the comments in this video, like the definition of what a medicine is, because uh, it's extremely broad. Uh, and I think a lot of people will appreciate that definition uh, that goes into the different sub clauses. What I wanted to raise, and I mean, we've spoken about this briefly in the past about rooibos, like, could that be considered here? Yeah. Like, if we think about rooibos tea, it, could that fall within the description here yeah, of a medicine and also within the control of uh, category D complementary medicine? So I'm actually on that point. So um, I'm going to read you a passage um, because essentially it's apparent that whether or not a substance will be defined as a medicine is primarily, primarily concerned with the use and the substance in question. Mm. And there was a case called the Treatment Action Campaign versus RAF. And it was observed by that court that the purpose of the Medicines Act is to protect the public against any sort of, of, of fraud through assessing and controlling the quality and efficiency of medicine. It's not the intention of the legislator to control substances which are ordinarily drunk by men, such as rooibos tea as long as such substances are ordinarily used and there are no claims of medicinal efficiency. So in my view, the use of a particular substance is the determining factor in deciding whether or not it's a medicine. So if you adopt this approach, one, you are able to limit the seemingly overbroad definition of medicine and to use a rooibos tea example in order to emphasize the purpose of the act. So if a person were to sell rooibos and to hold out to the public that that actually cures of writers yeah, gotcha. that would fall under the definition of medicine <clears throat> but yeah. for the reason for such funding would not be difficult you know a number of people are likely to start using robots in the hopes that it will then treat prevent or cure arthritis mm. so the only logical way to protect the public against claims like this would be doing to bring the robots tea within the definition of medicine so its quality, safety, and efficiency could actually be controlled and regulated. But if those claims are not being made, and it's not the purpose of that substance, it shouldn't be regulated under the Medicines Act. Yeah, fully agreed on that point. I mean, and this is the thing, it's like it's difficult to have to rely on courts to bring practicality sometimes back to, to these definitions. And um, last thing we want to see is constant uh, contention. You know, like, what what is it? Go to court. You, you, you didn't even think you were breaking the law. Next thing you know, you are in violation of the definition uh, or the Medicines and Related Substances Act. Uh, so that's exactly why we want to highlight and talk about this, because I think it's quite an important topic. Because, I mean, at this point, I know individuals and companies that have invested quite a bit of money in terms of going and aligning with the complementary C uh, in terms of Category D. Like they've started the process of getting set up as a complementary medicine. Now, essentially, as it stands, as of the recording of this video, like you said, like this is suspended. Uh, you know, is there, and I think let's talk about this practically because, you know, there is also the remote possibility that a separate entity gets established to regulate the space because at this point that could be a spin-off in terms of how this evolves. Uh, and it also might deal with the backlog issue. But, um, you know, 
what would what do, what is your advice if you had a client and said like i've got these products i mean surely yes we all agree that it should be regulated so maybe i should focus on the manufacturing but do i invest the time in terms of the advertising the patient uh leaflets uh, the labeling claims I, is it worth it or is it not worth it it's maybe a more practical question i suppose it's no clear answer but uh, let's i'd love to hear your view on it Sure. Yeah. Look, it is a difficult one to to answer in the sense of, you know, when you put it into context of investments, I mean, the court has admitted to the fact that it is a lot of cost and time in order to bring yourself into the space of SARPRA and to become compliant with its regulations. The SCA confirmed this. It's no secret. It's not, cannot be denied. That being said, though, if your product has some can fall into the definition of medicine. So if you want, I can read it to you. So, um, ooh, now my screen's let me one sec my screen jump no, so i good. can read it to you but um you know that the point is so um i might so the definition of medicine is that it's any substance or mixture of substances used or purporting to be used for use or manufacturing in the diagnosis treatment mitigation modification or prevention of disease abnormal physical or mental state or the symptoms thereof of humans or it's used in the restoring, correcting, or modifying any somatic or psychic or organic function in humans. So like you say, it's already quite a wide definition, but then they expanded on this with complementary medicines and within complementary medicines, we had the definition of um, food supp um, health supplements. And that's where it became too wide. That's where yeah. the SEA said no. This is not a medicine. You are extending too far. So the point I would like to get to is, is if your product does fall into the definition of medicine, because we have to be mindful, the definition of medicine stands, it's not being struck down. So if you if your product is going to diagnose or treat or correct any psychic organic function in the human, anything or the mental state of a person, it is far safer for you to consider your product as a medicine and prepare yourself for registration. Yeah. Um, if, however, you know, you feel like your product is actually not a definition of a medicine, meaning it's not making any sorts of health claims in that regard, then I would maybe consider just holding off on the registration itself. That being said, call up notices need to be issued if you are going to have a registered product, meaning if SARPA requires you to have a registered product, they will give you what is called a call up notice. And that call up notice then means within six months of time, you need to be compliant with the regulations. So um, if your product in general doesn't have a call up notice against it, and you do not make any health claims, I would say continue with your product and see if a call up notice is going to be issued. If however, your product is going to be a medicine, it will have some sort of a health claim to it, prepare yourself in advance for regulations in advance for SARPA control have your GMP facility in, in order, have everything in order and set yourself up from the start in order to be compliant with those regulations. Because as I've said, they are very, very dedicated to controlling and safeguarding anything that is con considered a medicine. And that's the test that you need to apply for yourself right now. Yeah, no, fully. I think that's very practical. I mean, at the end of the day, I, as always, like if you're making some kind of therapeutic claim, expect to substantiate it i mean that that's clear and i agree with you like i'll limit uh, or i'll put in the comments below also the definition of complementary medicine because that really is super broad from the description you described for medicine i mean it's basically anything derived from plants and it goes on within the authorities rights and then it talks about just influencing the physical and mental state of an individual super broad so uh, i have to say thank you again for your time because i think this is such a important topic because it speaks to the heart of you know general health I mean, when we're, when we're limiting, because I mean, at some point you could argue that um, over-regulating something like health supplements limits the access to health supplements because it's less viable to have those products on the market. And as a result, they become more expensive. And in a country where we want to enable access to wellness products uh, to the more general public, I think it's really important to be careful about where we toe the line when it comes to regulation. And then I also think it's really important to see enforcement because there's often cases where I've even seen like completely illicit products that are being sold everywhere. And it's it's like, well, you know, there are a lot of operators that want to operate within the legal framework and yet the store next door is, is breaking it 
uh, clearly as day. Uh, and I think that's the that's the kind of thing where you know I'm, I'm hoping to see some reforms in the space. Uh, and I, I appreciate you making the time to bring awareness to this topic because it's often overlooked in terms of just discussions and what's the next step and how do I start this? And and I think it's important that people appreciate the, these nuances, especially regarding complementary medicines or category D medicine. Uh, and uh, I'll be sure to include some links here as well. Dan Marie, thank you so much for your time. It was an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for your time, Jeff. Um, if our viewers are interested, both the High Court and the SEA judgments are discussed on the Shinders Attorney's website, which is shinders.co.za. They can have a full read of both the judgments there if they're interested. And I'm sure you will also include in the links and descriptions of the definitions. But it's been really a great conversation with you. It always is. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Awesome. I'll include the links.